At first, a place is a shell. Mud or mother of pearl, you inhabit it without knowing what it is. When I was a child in a small South African gold mining town in the 30s, I was feeling out its meaning, as the child Helen does in my first novel, The Lying Days. One day, she strays from the neat colonial blandness of her parents' house on the mine to the row of mine concession stores. Black miners, recruited from all over Southern Africa, buy cheap manufactured goods here. And some traditional ones, not to be found in the town's white shopping centre. I could no longer be bored by, or disbelieving of, the idea of the beckoning witch and the collection of pumpkins and lamps and mice that shot up into carriages, genie and coachmen. These dusty lion's tails, these piles of wizened seeds, these flaking grey roots and strange teeth, the peeled skin of a snake curling like an apple skin, a dragon, this collection of tooth and claw and skin and sluggish potion, brought who knows by whom, or how far, or from where, what the white child was seeing were the traditional ingredients of African pharmacopoeia, not strange at all to the continent on which she had been born. When I work on Sunday mornings, it was to the sound of drumming and singing coming from the compounds where the black miners lived. Nobody ever suggested to me that this was music. Music was the daily waltz at my dancing class. And the black men in blankets or strange dress I encountered and thought exotic, out of place. Later, I came to understand that I was the exotic element in this place. I with my white freckled face and European fairy tales. It was then that I learned the meaning to be read in places the meaning of people's lives to be found in their relation to where they live and on what terms. It's not only nature that determines the relation of people to where they live. It's also politics. Whether this involves making rural people into landless mine workers or moving whole communities from their homes in order to group them according to race. These things have been done to black people in this place, South Africa to which I belong. <laughs> the kind of experience I had as a child was the beginning of the process by which places have become metaphors for the states of mind of people in my books. No black man may buy this land. The Land Act of 1913 took the right away from him. Mehring, in my novel The Conservationist, is a white industrialist in pig iron. For weekends, he's bought himself a farm. An unknown black man is found murdered there, near the river. The body is casually dug in by the police without any identification or any investigation of the crime. The grave is soon overgrown by reeds. No one remembers where it is.
Marrying read in the papers how hippos were aborting their fetuses in dried up pools. It was the fourth year of drought, but that was in another part of the country. Of course, it didn't affect him. The farm didn't depend on surface water. He didn't depend on the farm. He would have to buy a considerable amount of supplementary feed for the cattle, but that could all go down as a tax loss. I'm not in the yacht owning class, I'm afraid. <laughs> I have my bit of felt and my few cows. In Africa? A farm in Africa? How he must love Africa. And were there any wild animals there? The labor laws make Maring absolute master of the lives of his farm workers and their families. They live at his pleasure as eternal squatters. The influx control laws, which prevent blacks from seeking other work freely, create in their community a travesty of African traditional life. So the farm is also a feudal entity. Its existence so close to Johannesburg is a concrete metaphor for the basic contradiction in South African society, where the blacks are kept in a feudal condition politically, but industrialized where they are needed. I didn't write the novel to illustrate these underlying meanings. They grew as I wrote. Perhaps they grew out of the marrying in me, as he is in all white South Africans. Mehring's tenure is also what he has become as a man. A piece of paper that permits a white but no black to claim this land is a metaphor for Mehring's moral tenure in life. The blacks at once submit to him as servitors and escape him entirely as fellow human beings. He is deaf to them, not understanding their language. Moving among them, he's blind to them, because of the laws that have conditioned his attitude toward black people. Mehring walks about the land and his pleasure in possession of its peace and beauty is taunted by remembered conversations with his leftist mistress. You've bought what's not for sale. The final big deal. I'll bet you'll end up wanting to be buried there, won't you? Down there, under your willow trees. Very simply, sleeping forever with your birds singing to you, an old black peril tending your grave. <laughs> oh, Mehring, you're a hundred years too late for that end. That 400 acres isn't going to be handed on to your children's children. That bit of paper you bought yourself from the deeds office isn't going to be valid for as long as another generation. The blacks will tear up your piece of paper no one will remember where you're buried. But the land itself recalls everything. During a flood, the river washes the body of the unknown black man from its shallow grave. He's buried by the farm people, sowed like a seed in a claim on the land that will hold title long after the Land Act of 1913 has been scored out by history. The one whom the farm received had no family, but their women wept a little for him. There was no child of his present, but their children were there to live after him. They had put him away to rest at last. He had come back. He took possession of this earth, theirs, one of them.
I've lived most of my life in Johannesburg, to which the roads lead from the mining towns and the kind of place I had in mind as Maring's farm. And not only the roads. Just as this city draws people from all backgrounds, of all colours, in defiance of all barriers, so it produces a social chemistry terrible and marvellous. <laughs> The people in my novel, Berger's Daughter, are that chemistry in action. Rosa Berger is the daughter of a white revolutionary who has given his life for a positive future when racialism shall be dead. Rosa Berger herself is like many of the people black and white in my books. They are what they are because of where they have been placed in the strangely imposed social and economic order of this city. Out of the defiance of that order, they create in themselves a personality, a life formed by its very strictures. Their humanity is a vein struck by its particular cruelty. Rose's Johannesburg becomes a metaphor for political consciousness. Soweto isn't a slum in the usual sense of a squatter's camp or decayed neighborhood whose squalor arouses outrage at first sight. The outrage is that this pattern of environment is calculated and decreed by law for blacks because they are black. From the point of view of bricks and mortar, it's being improved. There's a small percentage of people who earn enough to build houses like these. What you can't see is that no one has freehold rights here, as whites do wherever they live. What you can't see is the legal status of these more than a million black Johannesburgers. Thousands have been stripped of their South African citizenship by being declared citizens only of the rural black homelands where most have never lived. Rosa Berger saw segregated black townships this way. These restless broken streets where definitions fail, the houses like the outhouses of white suburbs, multiplied in institutional rows, the smell of offal cooking, the neat patches of mealies between shebeen yards stinking of beer and urine, the litter of twice discarded possessions, first thrown out by the white man and then picked over by the black. Is this conglomerate urban or rural? No electricity in most of the houses. A telephone, an almost impossible luxury. Is this a suburb or a strange kind of junkyard? The enormous backyard of the whole white city. White people are in possession here. Blacks once lived in this suburb. They were rejected to make way for whites and it was renamed Triumph. Hovel, cottage or palace, black township or white suburb, all these places are confines within which we're supposed to keep apart, classified by shade of skin, curly or straight hair. Hey. 
In most ways, the laws succeed only too well. Blacks carry the Dompas, like the Yellow Star. Without it, they've no right to be in Johannesburg at all. Certain hotels are granted something called international status. This suggests, not without truth, they are out of this world, the world of South African colour bar. Black and white may drink and eat together in the bars and restaurants of hotels like this one. But the meaning of the scene is not to be read in what you are seeing. If there were to be a space for dancing here, the blacks would not be allowed to get up and dance along with the whites. The real meaning of such places is that the concessions they represent have no meaning in the daily lives of most blacks. In the long struggle of blacks to free themselves through the right to political power, many attempts have been suppressed by decree and state violence. But the flare has been struck again and again from the chemistry of this city. Speaking of these rebel children of Soweto 76, Rosa paraphrases Lenin. They seem to know what is to be done. She echoes the remarks of Mehring's mistress in The Conservationist about the heritage of his children. Our children and our children's children, the sins of the fathers. At last, the children avenge on the fathers the sins of the fathers. The old phrases crack and meaning shakes out wet and new. Soweto 76 established a change in the attitude of blacks towards themselves that had been growing inside them. Black consciousness is the rejection of insult disguised as privilege, of a white imposed vision of oneself, of patronage as a placebo for political change. The effect has been a general breaking away among blacks from all unnecessary contact with whites. This is a rebuff for whites like myself. So far as possible for people legislated into privilege, we've defied racism and lived our lives in the context of Soweto as well as the white suburbs. And it's even harder to take for whites far, far braver than I am, who have gone to prison along with blacks in the struggle against racism. The old phrases crack and meaning shakes out wet and new. A change of attitude has had to come about too among whites here who can't see their destiny without real contact with blacks. It's something that started with beginning to hear the miners' drums as music. There are places where real contact happens despite the disapproval of the white government on one side and of doctrinaire blacks on the other. Now, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I have asked uh, is it to edit the next issue of the uh, classic, you see. Oh, don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Talk literature, talk African literature, yes. Some black and white enterprises take up the albatross of 300 years racial and economic oppression of blacks. Raven Press is a rogue publishing house, so far as the South African censors are concerned. This is a launching party for five new Raven books. Raven's a combined black-white effort, but it expresses black urban culture as the mainstream. These warriors are not Macbeths, but Sharkers, the 19th century black king. Not what God dare claim perfection. 
the gods that show remorse lay claim to man's forgiveness. The founder king shall dare no less. My nightmare. It's a form of truth about Johannesburg. The, the walls of this shabby old building vibrate. The Federal Union of Black Arts is open to people of all colours, although its purpose is black creativity. There are whites who don't want to teach, they want to learn. When you ask someone for a job, you are nervous. It doesn't matter if he is black, green, white, yellow. You've got to sit in such a way that you want that job, you want money. You're nervous. You want this job. This was once Johannesburg's cotton garden. Now it's a theatre complex on the western side of the centre city where skin pigment spills over boundaries. Yeah, right. Over the mountains. Over the blue work and a dragon stain across the great Karoo Desert fighting the fevers of the tribes. Part of this play, Shades of Brown, shows a bizarre therapy session between a white security policeman and a coloured squatter. Take the wagons together. Right, the thorn bushes in between. Women and children behind loading the guns. What the hell are you playing at, Feltzman? You're supposed to be a tribesman, man. You go out there and get shot. No, man, I'm on your side in the locker. You are the tribes, man. You get shot. You want to play some games, eh? Hey, some games, ain't now we have some fun. Ah. Hey, what about Blood River? What about Sharp? Hey, put that gun away, man. How many joking, man? Come on, Dutch man. Hey, charge! Boom! You're dead. Through some legal loophole, the court is still not officially designated for whites only. Blacks at the market theatre are not here under concession. <laughs> the bitterness and frustration of events off stage carry tension. Does the government interfere with your writing? No. Does it? it we're, not writing, we're not writing for the government. No, 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 not writing for the. No, 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 it's not. The, no, it's not the, but it's here the realities are explored and emotions put to work. There's a particular meaning in these places. If one could be sure to reach it, to read it. It's also natural. These gatherings can be read as the promise that this will be a great city where race will count for nothing. Or they could be seen as islands of repressive tolerance allowed a city whose ferment can't be contained completely. Listen, Zulus. Listen to what the people tell me about this land of ours. We hear how the clans are chattering, chattering about you. Like so many birds. When we say birds, we mean the golden finches. Those whites who stripped the cornlands of Dingana and Senzanga Corner. Ha! They finished them off. What does it all signify so long as tear gas, dogs, guns and armoured cars are at the ready? Blacks have been granted trade union rights at last, hedged about with conditions, but rights nevertheless. Out in the factories and the streets, they are seizing the chance to take in their own hands their power as workers. Perhaps the only real meaning of Johannesburg is to be read there now. July's People is a novel I finished in 1980. It's again realised in terms of a specific landscape that expresses its theme. The place is the open country once again. But the situation of the characters is much more extreme than that of Maring, the black farm workers, the farm on the outskirts of Johannesburg in The Conservationist. The landscape is far removed on the very limits of South Africa's borders. As an internal landscape, it's on the very limits of Johannesburg's existence itself, of what that has been. The white Johannesburg family in this book is living in some possible near future, not the future of Berger's daughter, Rosa. 
The white couple have failed to change themselves sufficiently in a society that hasn't summoned the will to bring about radical, peaceful change. There comes a day when whites can't just hop on a plane and jump ahead of threat to their possessions and lives. The family flees at the invitation of their black servant, July, to take shelter in his remote home village. The theme of the conservationist was stasis, a man's attempt to take a pause in history. The theme of July's people is violent flux, a displacement not only from white suburbia to a mud house, but a reversal of roles expressed by a reversal of environments. The servant becomes master of the situation. The black man's village is exchanged for the white man's city. The white woman has remembered to bring along anti-malaria pills and toilet rolls. But other adaptations for survival are necessary. The vast bush she sees from the hut that shelters her is no longer freedom from city life the family used to enjoy on camping holidays. Africa, where she was born, has become an imprisoning enormity of space to which she has not succeeded in belonging and from which she cannot escape.